Dr. Rolando Masferrer left his home here on the early morning hours of October 31st, 1975, turning the keys to his ignition, a car bomb placed under his vehicle exploded, claiming his life. Immediately a group calling itself Zero came forward and claimed responsibility for the assassination, as well as for the targeted killing of Jose Elias de la Torriente one year prior. Now this group claimed to be acting on behalf of Fidel Castro, and it claimed it was a communist insurrectionary group. However, people began to wonder who had actually killed both of these men, because they both had enemies in both camps. For example, Mass Ferrer was very well known as a communist fighter in the Spanish Civil War, and upon returning had fought tooth and nail for Cuban dictator Batista. On top of that, he had also befriended Santo Traficante and Jimmy Hoffa, and was a very well-known loan shark, sending money to what he called the 30th of November organization, which aimed to assassinate Fidel Castro. He had also sent boats to the island, which was an utter failure. So a lot of people could have blamed him, even though he had a very, very vested interest in killing Fidel Castro. On top of that, the other man that was assassinated that was claimed by the Group Zero, Jose Elias de la Torriente, was an elderly financier of these sorts of operations, and he had put forward a plan called Plan Torriente, which entailed military actions and sabotage on the island. When he eventually assessed this plan as no longer viable because Cuban security had been upgraded to the point where they knew that it would be a suicide mission, he was also assassinated. So people began to conjecture, was this the act of a communist insurrectionary group, or was it the act of the CIA, of other Cuban exile politicians, of other militants? And it was really unknown until a defector from Cuba came forward in their intelligence community and did claim that at least as far as Masfero the Tiger is concerned, he was killed on orders of Fidel Castro and the hit was carried out by a colonel. Only days after the assassination of Rolando Masferrer here in his Miami home, the death of Arturo Rodriguez Vives would be discovered by his wife in their New York-based apartment. Zero came forward and claimed responsibility for this assassination as well. And then a unusual character named Roberto Domecq comes forward. Roberto was seen fleeing the murder of Afro-Cuban voodoo practitioner Juan Oliver Hernandez. It seems like Roberto was an unhinged figure, but was employed periodically by Cuban exile militants. And he had filed a report with the police about Oliver Hernandez, claiming that Hernandez threatened to slit his throat for some sort of a voodoo ritual. When he was taken in by police, he claimed that he had been paid by Cuban exile leaders to kill De La Torriente because Torriente had betrayed their plans. He also claimed to have information on the killing of Masferrer, but this never came forward, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. And a little bit more background on Rolando Masferrer's activities here in South Florida. In late September 1960, Rolando sent four boats to Cuba, hinting at CIA involvement, or at least the involvement of some pretty elite private businesses. The one boat to reach the island contained U.S. citizens Alan D. Thompson, Anthony Zarba, and Robert O. Fuller. All three men were executed on orders of Fidel Castro. In December 1960, the Miami Herald reported that Rolando was training 53 mercenaries at the mansion of Howard Hughes and was spreading info through a New York-based Spanish-language newspaper, possibly a connection to business dealings in that state. He met JFK sometime in 1961, but Kennedy never met with him again. He was just too radical. In 67, he amassed a stockpile and planned to invade Haiti with his soldiers of fortune. This operation was called either Project Nassau or Project Istanbul, and Cuban naval forces foiled their plots to land at the beachhead. From 1970 to 72, he was in a U.S. prison. His murder occurred in 1975, apparently on orders from Fidel Castro himself, and carried out by Department Q of the Cuban Intelligence Services. Nowadays, the assassination of Jose de la Torriente is mostly forgotten, or at most used as a historic footnote to tell the story of other people that were assassinated in the Miami area during the Cold War. But when I asked about his grave location in the cemetery office, the man telling me was immediately very interested because apparently his grandmother used to make small donations, $10 here, $15 there, to Torriente's business because it was being used in the fight for a free Cuba. And he was killed by an assassin's bullet, a sniper, who took a shot at him as he was watching TV one evening through his living room window. This happened right next to his wife, 
Gilda. Now, what is interesting about these assassinations is that it could have been done, of course, by Castro, and probably was, but Del Toriente and men like Rolando Masferrer had upset the mainstream Cuban exile community. In fact, in the months leading up to it, De La Torriente was accused of spending more money on his construction business than he was to plan Torriente and the invasion and agitation of Cuba by private business interests, which was Plan Torriente. So he was killed, oddly enough, by a different method as Rolando Masferrer. And you'd think that if Cuban intelligence services were going to kill somebody with a car bomb, which again, I think they did, they would probably keep that MO, at least if they used a terror group, Zero, in order to accomplish this. But the fact that they were killed by separate methods, it's interesting, it's unusual.